So welcome to Module 11, um, Experimental Studies, our lecture um, for BAS 3020. And as I've been trying to do for in some of these lectures, uh, for online students, you don't really get a lot of interaction with me, so I try to tell a few personal stories. This photograph is one of the most unique and mysterious experiences of my life. Um, it took place in White Park Bay in Northern Ireland. and. Um, it's really hard to explain in a brief moment, but I was in some, it was a difficult time in my life, and um, I awoke in the middle of the night feeling like I had been woken up and felt called or compelled um, to leave the hostel I was staying in and climb down a cliff to the ocean, which was right next door. And it was a beautiful night, and 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 this is after all of this kind of magical, mysterious thing happened to me, and, and that I felt very, very connected in the world. And um, it was so transformative for me that I came back and spent about an hour or two just journaling about what had transpired in front of a fire, making a cup of tea, since I'm in Ireland, and... Um, and um, and then I just it just was, again was so magnificent to me that I took this selfie way before selfies were popular. I don't know if this is really considered a selfie since I had to you know use whatever that's called the automatic timer. But the reason I share this photograph is that um, when this was going on, I I kept hearing the words of a Mary Oliver poem that you'll hear later in this video today, um, the journey. And it, it just really spoke to me as I was climbing down in the dark this cliff to get down to the ocean. So anyway, it's an interesting story. And if we run into each other, you may ask me about it because it's definitely one of those moments in my life that will always stand out. And in fact, it makes White Park Bay, where this happened, um, one of my favorite places on the planet. In Module 11, um, we're going to be getting close to finishing up a couple of our texts, 100 questions. We're going to be looking at questions 71 through 80. In 52 things about customer analytics, we're going to be looking at chapters 45 or through 52 or the next of those things. He calls things chapters and chapters things. So um, in Canvas, uh, we don't have a lot of material. It may look like a lot, but it's really not that much. We have a glossary, of course on experimental studies, a section on experimental studies, challenges in experimental design, a really short and um, easy to understand video on placebo effect, control groups, and double blind experiment. Um, <clears throat> then we have a, a, a very short executive summary on a real world study experiment. Um, and then a couple of videos, battling bad science video, very funny amusing and very insightful, especially in the, you know, in this world and time of fake news. Definitely watch that. I think you'll enjoy it. It's a little bit long. I think it's about 12 minutes, but I don't, I think it'll go by fast. The guy is funny and, and entertaining. And then there's a one minute video about an experiment slash advertisement um, done by Carlsberg, um, which is a European beer. Um, I think this was done in Brussels and it's, it's quite amusing. And it's worth the minute. I think you'll get a good chuckle out of it. And um, my question to you is, why is that an example of an experimental study? And um, then there's two resources that are within the UNT library um, for giving you some help with synthesizing information and also writing um, some writing help. You, you know, the final part of your uh, survey is actually, uh, you know, reporting those results. And so that's very, very important. You have a quiz, of course, and then this week there's a discussion. Number five. Our reading from the text 100 Questions About Survey Research is from Part 8, Exploring the Data with Univariate Statistical Analysis. 71. What are the goals of data analysis? Here, this is kind of the final step of our research question, looking at all the data um, and trying to figure out the meaning from it. So we're going to um, analyze the data to try to figure out what we've got. Um, the first part of that is univariate statistical analysis, and that's just simply looking at one variable at a time. Uh, 
you know, we might be looking at, if maybe we asked everyone what was their income level. And so then we'd see like, what was the range of that? What was the median of that, et cetera? And that's univariate. We're only looking at one variable. And then we might look at bivariate relationships, the relationship between two variables. So we might want to look at levels of education versus their income. Um, and then multivariable, we might look at three things, the relationship between education, income, and also gender. Um, so the goal of the data analysis is simply to kind of um, figure out if we've answered our question and how did we answer and what was that answer. 72, what are variables? Uh, there are three basic type of variables. Continuous, this is ratio and interval, ordinal and nominal. We've had some discussion about these before, but this just goes into some more detail around those. What are descriptive statistics? This is just a set of methods used to analyze data um, to understand and describe the sample. So you're going to look at each variable and measure its central tendency. Remember the central tendency is just the average or the median or the mode. <clears throat> and then you're going to look at the um, dispersion. So what does that mean? So say, for example, we were looking at income. You might look at the average income that was reported. So you take the average of all the sample. That's your central tendency. Your dispersion could be a number of things. It could be the whole range. What was the lowest income reported to the highest income reported? Um, <clears throat> how does it fall out in a graph? Um, how far is the, are, are each of those from the average? So it's, it's a number of different things to try to get more information about the sample as a whole. Make sure you look at the table here because it talks about the different types of variables and um, what you would use, whether you would use the mode or the mean, et cetera, and it gives good examples. So it's a great table. How do we estimate central tendency and variation in categorical and ordinal variables? Again, we've got some good tables here to help you understand that. Um, but we use a frequency procedure to estimate these. Um, <clears throat> And a frequency distribution provides a lot. Um, so you're looking at all possible variables of the, all possible values of the variable alongside how many people are in that category, if you will, and then the percentage of the sample that falls um, within to that value. And so they, here they give a frequency distribution of race. It's a table with percentages. And then um, they give a bar chart as well. So you can see a visual representation versus a kind of a, just a data or spreadsheet. How do we examine central tendency and continuous variables when using um, the median? So the arithmetic mean or median is used to estimate the central tendency or the typical response. The mean is calculated as the average and the median is what's in the very middle, what's in the 50 percentile and it gives you different ways of measuring this. Again, we have a couple good charts here or one good table to give you an example where they look at um, years of school and GPA. And we get into more complicated measures like when we're using the median. The median is the point estimate. If we're using the median as the point estimate, then the range and the interquartile range, which was described in 75, read through that, and which is just a breakdown by quarters, the first, second, third, and fourth. Um, this is simply the middle point of, again, the, the uh, responses to your survey. We're not going to get probably into that much detail on some of these, but it's a good for you to, when you're looking at your data in your survey project, to kind of see if you can calculate um, the median mode and, and mean for all of your variables or the ones that it's applicable to. Seventy seven teaches us how to calculate the standard deviation um, when we're using mean or average as the central ten tendency. And this gets a little more complicated, but they give you a formula in here to, on how to figure it out and also another good example. What are inferential statistics? Remember, while the sample 
is what we're evaluating. Well, where do the responses fall for the sample? What we're really interested in is the population or the whole category of people that we have a hypothesis about. And so um, what we're doing is we're taking the data out of the sample and inferring that this is appropriate or um, consistent, consistent with the entire population. In order to do that, you have to have collected what's called a probability sample, which just means it's equally likely that anyone could be picked. You're not um, entering any bias, et cetera, in your um, sample. And our math is getting increasingly difficult. How do we infer a population parameter? So here, again, we're talking about we've only taken a small sample of the population um, how do we make sure, how do we use our um, sample points like the mode, median, etc., cetera, uh, to predict the population parameter point, okay? So here it's talking about how you calculate that based upon standard deviation, etc., cetera, uh, and gives you, again, a, a, an example for how to do that. And finally, what is significance testing? Okay, so here what we're doing is um, trying to figure out uh, is our, are the results of our sample again um, uh, correct for the population as a whole? And so what you do here is you use a significance test, okay? And so um, the example they use in the book is that, you know, you have a hypothesis that the average GPA, the mean GPA for a group or for the population of a specific set of college students, et cetera, is 3.5. Your significance um, test uses a, an opposite. Um, you have the first hypothesis and then you have a null hypothesis, which is just the negation of yours. So the null hypothesis says um, the mean is not 3.5. And what you're doing here is you are trying to figure out, again, sort of the statistical difference um, and it's called a p-value, um, is the probability that the test statistic is the true value of the population. And this was what we learned to calculate in 79 as well. So there's some increasingly difficult math there. Take your time in reading through them, especially from 75 on. Make sure you copy those formulas. You may need to use those in your survey um, analysis. Some of them you will definitely have to use in your survey analysis. Our module reading from our other textbook, 52 Things About Customer Analytics, this is a great one and you really should pay attention to this, not just for your survey project in this course, but this has a lot of great insight into communication. In fact, this is my biggest soapbox um, in any working environment I've spent. Um, I've worked in corporations, I've worked in government organizations, I've worked in nonprofits, and now I'm a professor, so I'm working in academic institutions. And almost across the board, the majority of people do not know how to effectively communicate. And this um, five or seven chapters here does a great job of talking about that. And really what you want to do is to make understanding easier for your audience. Always. If you're writing an email, um, if you're writing a report, etc., and especially in the workplace, you want people to get the information quickly, easily, succinctly, and if they want more information, you either have it available so they can find it or they come back to you and ask. The mistake that most people do is trying to include everything and in a format or style um, that makes it hard to read, um, to hard to find information. So let's go through these and I'll hit some of my own soapbox outside of customer analytics. Why less is more. Number one rule, why less is more. <clears throat> An insight poorly communicated is unlikely to have uh, impact, so it is important to be as clear in your communication as in your analysis. Um, you have a 100-page report. Is your client going to read that? No, they're paying you to do that analysis, so they want you to summarize it and tell them the highlights of it. Um, he talks about how when they got, um, when they had a team that was doing that, 
um, they help them to break it down to a one page um, executive summary or something. Did they change the analysis? No, um, but they made it easy for the, the, the audience, the client to understand the impact of that report. You should always think about that um, when you're writing an email even um, do you need to be saying all that you need to be saying are you writing in paragraphs paragraphs suck write in bullets um, it's easier for us to read more white space makes it more likely that I will read people that get a page long email that's uh, looks like a storybook out of a novel are less likely to read it this is why advertisers and marketers create a lot of white state space and images um, in advertisement because it draws people in and if they don't have to read so much, um, they're more likely to pay attention to the ad. The elevator speech. Not only should your written communications be um, succinct and small and, and direct, but you should, in, in the context of your report, you should be able to give a 30 second to one minute kind of pitch about your study. Um, what were the key findings? How did you get there? Um, and this is not easy. In fact, sometimes writing less takes a little bit more work than you know, writing this full um, report, et cetera, or doing all your analysis. So an elevator speech is a brief uh, 30 seconds. It says here, I think it's a minute summary of your answer to the client's business or market problem. Um, they got great examples again in this section. I really like them. Uh, McKinsey teaches all their consultants to have a prepared elevator speech. If you find yourself with a client and he or she asks, how's the project going? You do not say fine or talk about sports. Um, you deliver the elevator speech. You do this verbally. There are no charts. You're not pulling things out of your briefcase, etc. You're just telling them um, about the key elements of the report or, or the study, and it might be in progress. Um, <clears throat> so he talks about that. I, the example he uses here is like, you are not writing a mystery novel where you have all this data and then at the, on page 99 is your finding that someone has to go all the way through there. That's great for an Agatha Christie story, but um, no, no business person um, wants to do the hell we don't want to do that you don't want to do that you don't want to have to wade through a hundred pages to get to the answer a one-page executive summary I'm a big advocate for this I've made students do this in most of my classes I teach other classes um, here at UNT in the BAS program and and force students to actually do this um, to summarize their data um, in a one page or two page summary and also to make it look like it's a magazine um, advertisement so that it draws people in it's easy to find the information it's stylized and formatted a one page executive summary this is the first page of any report tell the client up front what he or she hired you to help with it gives the answer it gives the key support information for that answer and as appropriate maybe next steps that that client should do if they need to be reminded of the objective, why did we start this project? Um, that should be in there too, but it, again, keep it to one page. Um, and again, he kind of goes through um, a couple examples um, where they had this, <clears throat> where they did this. A 10 to 20 page report. Um, clients love reports that make a clear actionable recommendation and then support the recommendation with concise analysis. Um, this is kind of an interesting model he uses from a book called The Pyramid Principle. Evidently that was big at McKinsey. Um, and it basically is, you know, breaking your your study, your um, analysis, whatever, down into um, three or four major points, um, making a point and then, you know, some charts, et cetera, that back it up. What this reminded me of was maybe a PowerPoint presentation um, so that it's less about reading and more about the visuals um, for someone to go through. Um, I'm not quite sure because he doesn't go into great detail, um, but it, it's again another concise way, you know, a brief summary and then, you know, your first point. Why do you have that first point, the data to support it? Your second point, why you have that point, the data to support it, and then the next steps. 
A so what about so what's. Synthesize, don't summarize. Um, this is good. This was learning for me as well when I read this. A summary is a shortened list of something that doesn't add insight. Synthesize is the so what of a list. And he has a really funny example in here. Um, it says, um, what are the facts? The facts are I broke my knee. A burglar knocked in my car window. I got a speeding ticket. Those are the facts. A summary of that would be my knee, my car, and my pocket ball, pocketbook were all damaged recently. But what would be the synthesis of that? What's the insight? Insight. I've been living dangerously. And so I think that's a, a clever way of, of providing um, uh, not just telling, again, a summary of all the things, grouping them, but providing, so what? You know, why do I care? You know, and that's what you're really answering. Why do I care? Out of all of your analysis, out of your survey, what is important about that? What did you learn that's important to the audience, the listener that you're communicating with? Another example in here was done well too, um, where a business was trying to figure out all of their segments, you know, maybe where they needed to put time and energy. And so they just had a chart that kind of listed whether they were a leader, um, a follower, or simply competitive in that segment. And so they used um, a red light. So where they were a follower, uh, it was red. Where they were competitive, it was yellow. And where they were a leader, it was green or superior. And so it was a great visual, um, and, you know, even if you had this big chart and then you had a red light on the side, red, red yellow, green, stop, Mer, you know, a uh, yield go, it, it could, you know, it quickly um, gives the so what, focuses people, etc. Data visualization. And this, the red light thing is a great example of data visualization in my mind. In this section, he really talks about um, different kind of quantitative charts, pie charts, bar charts, horizontal charts, line charts, etc. and when to use them. Um, and, and it's good. It's good insight. I've never seen something so quite so detailed like it is here. Um, and you know, charts are great. You know, charts are very powerful. In fact, if you probably hated algebra, most people do. But you know, the father of algebra, if you will, to some degree, was Rene Descartes, who figured out that whole Cartesian system, which was the X Y grid. Well. This is one of the most powerful tools mathematically for humans because most of us are very visual. Why is that? Because it made numbers and insight be very visual. For example, if I gave you a bar chart about my company's revenues over the last 10 years and it looked like a stair step up, you would immediately know that assuming my costs were this, you know, not going up the same way, that my company was doing pretty good. I was selling more and more each year. And you would know that in two or three seconds. So you're, you are able to interpret numerical quantitative data very quickly um, with these visual tools of simply a bar chart, et cetera. So you might want to, you know, definitely page through, not might want to, you definitely want to page through that and look at, um, you know, when to use what kind of chart for your uh, report on um, your survey project when you're doing the analysis. And proposals that sell. This is a good one too, if, especially if you're looking for a job soon after your college or even now about selling yourself. And he even has some, some imp insight here about, you know, going for job interviews. Um, but this is also kind of, um, you want to answer why um, why should someone hire you? And, you know, most people just list off their skills, list off their experience, and don't even take a little bit of time, a little bit of mental energy to say, if I was that guy hiring, what kind of person do I think they would want? And that might be doing a Google search of that company and seeing what their big issues are right now, or or that industry, et cetera, and thinking through that. Um, <clears throat> so what do winning proposals contain? 
uh, an explicit answer to why should you be picked or why should they pick your firm, um, a rationale of um, why you are making the recommendations you do. In this case, it sounds like there's already a proposal being made. Maybe they had an RFI request for information or an RFP request for proposal and you answer that as a company and then they're going to choose the company to actually do the research and move forward, which is very con common in consulting. <clears throat> and I love this too. The number three thing was on that was alternatives. And I'm always telling um, students and, and um, interns this, that when you're evaluating something, the things that you said no to like, you know, if you were, I run an internship program that's also the basis for the capstone course in Bass um, 4100. And um, if you're doing some research for a company, the no's are as important as the yeses. And what I mean by that is if you've ruled something out, tell them and tell them why, because that may save them time and energy in the future. They don't only want to know what you think they should do, but what they shouldn't do may be as valuable or more valuable even. And that's what he's talking about here, about when you looked at alternatives, what are some potential alternatives and what are some potential alternatives that you would highly recommend going against. Um, again, make sure it's short, make sure that they can get the information quickly and et cetera. And the last question. The question behind the question. Do not just answer the question posed, but answer the question behind the question. That is, think about why the person is asking a question and what information that person is, is really seeking, maybe indirectly. Um, and this again, I think, um, applies to you as a job interview, um, which is kind of, again, another interesting, insightful thing. He said the three questions for any in, in an interviewer are, when they're interviewing you, they're thinking, can this person do the job? Will this person love or like the job? And can I tolerate working with this person? Which I thought was quite amusing. So I always tell people in interviews to have PP questions, um, personal yet professional. You know, you don't want to go into too much detail about your personal, but if it's personal and professional, it helps you to connect with someone. Um, there was a great example in here too about, you know, some companies do have these kind of questions. And he said at McKinsey, they had a question is, um, why are man how manhole covers round? And trying to see if people can kind of have some intellectual acuity when figuring things out. And, and the rationale why they're round is that um, there's no way for that manhole cover to fall in on someone who's going down. Um, it cannot, because of the round shape, it can't um, squeeze through the hole, if you will. And um, But he said that one of their favorite responses they got was, because the manhole is round. Well, if you're going to have a, a cover for something, you got to have it the same shape. And um, likely that person got hired um, more for the fact that they would enjoy working with that person and, and was thinking in a different fashion. So this was really some good, interesting reading. Um, Again, I think it applies across the board. Less is more. Um, there's another video I use in a different class, and uh, she uses um, the example of a mini skirt. And she says, your communication should be like a mini skirt, um, just long enough to cover what it should and short enough to make it interesting. So it's time for our little pause again. I think we've been at this about 20 minutes or maybe even a half an hour by now. And um, again, I have another poem by Mary Oliver um, called The Journey, one of my favorites. I'm gonna have someone else read it. Um, Mary Oliver died in January of 2019 and this is from a tribute um, to her and it's the reciting of this poem. So enjoy, take a break, get a breath um, and come back refreshed to finish out the materials. This week, a legendary poet moved on from this plane, Mary Oliver, Mary Oliver. Her work was accessible and invitational and expansive. She took the time to explore and reveal the magical world hidden from all of us in plain sight. Her passing is aptly marked by her numerous words that play with our fragile mortality, such as the often quoted, tell me, 
What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Here in the cradle of some of our finest centers of higher learning, we'd like to share The Journey by Mary Oliver. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough, and a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the floor. Determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. Once again, our Canvas materials begin with a glossary of terms for experimental studies. By now you know what to do here, so I'll leave it at that. Our next Canvas material is um, an info sheet on experimental studies. Um, this is largely a reading sheet, um, but they are small sections and it's not very long. And these are the topics that it's covering, defining what an experiment is, topics for experiments, uh, a classic experiment example, pre-testing and post-testing, experimental and control groups, double-blind experiment, the placebo effect, selecting subjects, randomization, and matching um, in that category. So um, again, go through this material. You are required to know it for the quiz and, of course, need to know it for your um, survey and final exam. Next in Canvas, we have challenges in experimental design, which goes through a lot of different issues that you can have when trying to pinpoint um, the effect of one variable on your experiment. And so we're looking at the Hawthorne effect, variation on um, design, uh, remember validity and reliability, and then there are a number of internal validity threats. And over to your right, you can see Mr. DCC Smith, which is an acronym for some of the internal validity threats, maturation, regression towards, diffusion, causal time order, compensation, selection bias, etc. And so that's one of the ways that you can remember some of the threats is that acronym, Mr. DCC Smith. And next we have a short video that explains very effectively the placebo effect, control groups, and double-blind experiment. Our final materials in Canvas under the additional materials um, section is a, a, a short, very brief study about CBD oil. Um, it's really an executive summary and it's not even that uh, big of a summary, so it's a quick read. Um, there's a TED Talk with Bed, Ben Goldacre about um, battling bad science. Very amusing. And I definitely take a look at this. Um, I think it's not only insightful for our survey, um, but how people make the wrong inferences, even from published studies, etc. And especially when it's reported in the media, depending upon the media. I mean, he's using the Daily Mirror, which is not exactly... It's kind of like the, uh, the UK's equivalent of the National Enquirer. Maybe not quite that bad, but pretty close. Um, but he's got some great examples in there, and he's very amusing, um, and it's very short. Um, and then on the bottom left there, you'll see what looks like a group of people in a theater. This is only a minute or two video, and it's about an experiment that was conducted 
Um, it's quite amusing, and um, I think you'll really enjoy it. There's not a lot of detail about what was done with the experiment. It actually looks more like a commercial, but it, it really is kind of an experiment. And, and I'm curious, think about it. Why would this be an example of an experimental study? Um, and then there's some materials here for you that are from their links into the UNT library um, about synthesizing information. And that's something you have to do at the end of your um, study and also some writing help. And we've already seen in the previous materials um, in 52 Things, which was all about communication, um, how doing the analysis is obviously important, but then how you communicate that um, it maybe is not, uh, it's probably equally as important because you could have great research and poor communication and no one would learn. Um, and so that's the end of the materials for this module. Hopefully you've enjoyed them. I think there's some great ones in there.